Testing Warren Buffett's suggested retirement portfolio. Interesting. This is an article I just found while I was waiting between tennis matches watching my boys here today, which is why you might notice a little bit of tan skin. Uh, and I just, uh, so I was looking at this and I came across uh, my man Craig Israelson. Look at that, Craig Israelson. Remember him? We talked about him just the other day with his 712 portfolio which I'm a fan of, and I just came across this, so I want to share with you. It's a pretty good article, and this is from the financial-planning.com, again, uh, April 3rd, 2019. Picture this. You recommend to a client a retirement portfolio of consisting of 90% large-cap U.S. stocks and 10% short-term government bonds. That's it. Just those two ingredients in your client's nest egg. Is this crazy? Well, perhaps not, at least according to Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett got a question in a 2013 letter uh, that he delivered to shareholders from one of the, the investors say, hey, how would you benefit for a trust to benefit your wife? And he says, my advice to the trustee, in this case, the husband dies, he wants to make sure his wife is doing okay. The trustee is the person who manages the trust. Uh, could not be more simple. Put 10% of the cash in the short-term government bonds and 90% in a low-cost S&P 500 index uh, fund. I believe that's the trust's long-term results I believe the trust long-term results from this policy will be superior to those attained by most investors, be it pension funds, institutions, or individuals. And he didn't say this, but especially who employ high-fee managers. A retirement portfolio with only two asset classes may not meet a fiduciary standard, but nevertheless, let's analyze this approach to determine how it compares with other retirement portfolio models. All right. In this chart, Battle of the Retirement Portfolios, we see our four retirement models. The first is a seven-asset class model that includes equal portions of large-cap U.S. stock, small-cap U.S. stock, non-U.S. stock, real estate, commodities, U.S. bonds, and cash. The next model is a 60-40 portfolio consisting of 60% U.S. large and 40% U.S. aggregate bonds. The third model is a Buffett-suggested portfolio consisting of 90% large-cap U.S. stock and 10% short-term bonds. Each of these multi-asset models was rebalanced annually. In addition, a 100 basis point portfolio was assumed uh, and was lowered by the fee of the 100 basis points. All right, so a portfolio cost was assumed. In addition, a 100 basis point portfolio cost was assumed, and thus the total returns were lowered by one full percentage point. Finally, we have a retirement portfolio consisting of 100% cash represented by the return of the 90-day treasury. And he talks about the source, which is, uh, it, you can see all that. All right, so how did what, how did uh, Buffett suggest a retirement asset mix stock uh, stack up? The Buffett retirement portfolio uh, consists of an SP 500. Okay, gotcha. Uh, okay, as this study, I, okay, let's see. We need the methodology. Okay, as this study is focused on the performance of a portfolio during retirement, we needed a methodology to determine how much money will be withdrawn for the portfolio each year. I decided to use the annual withdrawal percentages stipulated by the RMDs, required minimum distributions. Thus, as research assumed the retiree was age 70 when the withdrawals began in a night in a $1 million starting balance in the portfolio. The time frame was a 49-year period from 1970 to 2018, and during that window of time, there are 25 20-year, 20 25-year rolling periods. So 25 times we had 25-year rolling periods. I examined five variables relative to the performance of each retirement portfolio, the success rate, uh, the average ending portfolio value at the end of each 25-year uh, period, the average annual withdrawal during each rolling 25 period, the average total return, uh, total amount withdrawn during each 25 period, and the standard deviation uh, during all 25 of the rolling 25 periods. So here, here we go. You ready? Let's see if I can't make this bigger. Oops. There we go. Annual withdrawals during each 25-year period determined by RMD. So the seven asset class, that's a 712. They all had 100% success rates, by the way, because it's only required minimum distributions they're taking out. So you never take it out more uh, than the portfolio simply because it's, it's, even if the portfolio is dropping like the cash, uh, it, it'll still be a percentage of the remaining balance. So you always have 100% success. Average ending balance after 25 years of withdrawals. We got 2.3 million in the 712 asset class, a diversified portfolio. Again, you got you know, essentially 12 buckets of money, each with 8.33% in there. Uh, 6040 had an average ending balance of 2.406 million, so 100,000 more. Buffett's portfolio had an average ending balance of 3 million, and the cash portfolio is 625. 
So Buffett's was ahead by $7 million from 1970 till 2018. Uh, the 60-40 was ahead by 100000 over the 712. Average annual draw amount. Again, Buffett smoked uh, everyone. Uh, 142 for the S&P 500, 60-40 mix. Buffett's was 167. $167,000 a year was the average annual withdrawal. The seven asset class was 141, and then cash was uh, far behind, of course, because it was in cash. So Warren Buffett's portfolio smoked uh, the 60-40 and smoked the more diversified one for sure. Average total withdrawn, now $3.5 million essentially for the same for both the 60-40 portfolio and the seven asset class one. But Warren Buffett's was $4.1 million, so that's $600,000 more, significantly higher. Standard deviation, Warren Buffett's was $1.7 million, so by far and away the most volatile. Uh, the the 60-40 was uh, quite a bit less, but that's still less volatile than the 712. So the, the more diversified had more volatility and actually had less uh, portfolio withdrawals and less of account balance as well, with a little bit more uh, diversity. Uh, Warren Buffett's had significantly more uh, income and significantly more account at the end of the 25 years, to, uh, the average of each 25 year, with a lot more volatility, which would make sense. All right. So a quick review of the results in the table does indeed confirm Buffett's wisdom. The 90-10 portfolio had the highest, we already talked about. Uh, however, it also had the largest standard deviation, just volatility. Uh, the question is whether it represents a sufficiently prudent model for clients. And my gut tells me no. Based on the logic of what the Department of Labor has referred to as a qualified default investment alternative. There are three QDIAs, a life cycle or target date fund, a balanced fund, and a professionally managed account. Target A funds and balanced funds employ multi -asset, multiple asset classes in their design as a way of moderating the, moderating the risk inherent in any single asset class. That's what the DOL, Department of Labor, is using for fiduciary standards. It's got to be uh, diversified across many different asset classes to moderate the risk inherent in any given one. The seven asset model here is anal analogous to a target date fund in the 60-40 portfolios representative of the typical balanced fund because the target day funds have a bunch of different asset classes. The Buffett model is simply not diversified enough and will rise and fall based largely on the success of the U.S. large cap stock market. Uh, for the majority of retirees, it's just not a prudent, not prudent to do that. I agree with that 100%. Uh, take note also that the RMD guarantees a portfolio cannot be liquidated uh, to zero simply because it's, it's not pulling enough money out. All right, so let's talk about this. Rising interest rates. This is the interesting. So before you jump into the 90-10 portfolio, let's think about this. One major factor to consider in this analysis is that of interest rates and how a rising rate environment will impact bond returns over the next 10 to 15 years. The analysis presented here covers the period from 1970 through 2018. The federal discount rate began its decline in 1982. The 75% of the 49-year period was during a declining rate environment, which provided a huge tailwind for U.S. bonds. In fact, the average annualized return of U.S. aggregate bonds from 1982 to 2018 was 764 this compares to an annualized return of 3.83 for U.S. bonds from 1948 to 1981, a period of rising interest rates. What if the performance of bonds over the next 10 to 15 years reverts to a return somewhere in the range of 3 to 4 percent, which absolutely is going to. There's no other way around that. If this occurs, the 64-40 portfolio will be impacted more dramatically. To test this possibility, I subtracted 400 basis points from the U.S. aggregate bond returns in this analysis as a way of projecting a future with lower bond returns. Now, here's what happened. The average ending portfolio balance in the seven asset class went from 2.3 million to 2.07 million, a decline of 12.94%. But the average asset class and the average balance in the 60-40 went from 2.4 million to 1.6 million, a decline of 32.3%. Yep, I agree with that 100%. Uh, the 90-10 Buffett portfolio, because it utilized the short-term government bonds, uh, didn't have nearly the same degree because only 10% were in bonds anyway, but it did decline about 4.7%. Declining equities. How about when equities? What if the performance of the U.S. stock market is less robust over the next 10 to 15 years? And again, Craig subtracted 400 basis points from the annual returns of the S&P 500 and 400 basis points from the annual returns of the Russell 2000. The bonds return, uh, returns were also held in the reduced state, uh, 400 basis points less for the, set, the seven asset class and 60-40 model. 
And this is where we see a steep decline in the Buffett portfolio because they have so much stocks. 90% were in U.S. stocks. In this case, a 90-10 average ending balance fell from 2.8 to 1.18, a decline of 50%. That's, I mean, that's the issue. Because it's not prudent to have all your eggs in one basket. If that one basket does incredibly well, like we've seen from 1970 to this year, you're in love. If the basket does not do that well, you're in bad shape, which is why no fiduciary or prudent investor would ever say put 90% of your portfolio in U.S. stocks, large stocks, and 10% in bonds. The 60-40 portfolio averaged uh, ending balance fell from 1.6 million to 896,000. And the diversified portfolio, the 712, fell from 2.0 to 1.5 million. If we project a bleaker future in terms of U.S. equity and bond returns, which we should, the seven asset class portfolio demonstrates material better historical performance as a retirement portfolio design. Of course, it should be noted that the other asset classes in the seven asset class portfolio could experience diminished returns in the future. I 100% agree with that. In summary, a more diversified portfolio likely stands a better chance of thriving in a rising interest rate environment in a climate in which equity returns are lower. It may not end up with the highest return in the end, which is, uh, which is one risk, but the broader overall risk is mitigated. Broad diversification just makes sense, even if Buffett's strategy could potentially give clients better returns. I mean, I want I, no argument for me at all. This is what's my issue with the Wellington Fund, is that if the Wellington Fund has all U.S. stocks and all U.S. bonds, if those two things did incredibly well, which we see. I mean, the bond market did, what do you say, 7.8%, 5.8% since uh, 2000. Let's see. He said, yeah, 7.64% from 1982 to 2018, the aggregate bonds did. It's just not going to happen. And Wellington Fund returns are based on that right there, 7.64. 30 to 40% of it was. The stocks from 1982 to 2018, U.S. stocks just killed. I mean, kicked butt and took names. There's no other way around that. It's just not going to happen again the way it did. It's not. That doesn't mean other things won't go down either, but the reason that Wellington looks so good in the U.S. Uh, S&P 500 and the uh, bond market looks so good is because those were the two of the best asset classing performers of all. You know, you're taking away countries, you're taking away asset classes, asset allocation. The U.S. was one of the best performing countries of all markets, and the two primary U.S. Uh, investments were the U.S. large cap stocks, the S&P 500, and the U.S. government and U.S. bonds. I mean. <laughs> But it's a huge market. Brazil, Japan, Russia, you name it. It is. So, I'm not, look, I'm not saying don't discount the U.S., but diversification rules, and it will rule in the future. Now, that doesn't mean you overperform. Diversification always means you have to say you're sorry. That's what it always means. But you won't get killed, but you're not going to make a killing. So, anyway, I thought it was pretty interesting, and I thought I'd share it with you. So, I hope you like what you see. Don't forget to push the no notification bell to be notified for future content, and we will see you next time. Thanks, Dan.